Hey Quest. In this video, we're going to talk about the importance of rules. Uh, now, it's one of the first questions I ask my uh, dog behavior clients as a dog psychologist. And uh, usually, uh, the answer to that question really indicates whether or not there is a healthy leader follower dynamic set up in the household. Now, uh, before I get into this uh, and give you some examples for rules, I want to uh, kind of talk about the psychology of rules for humans and dogs, because they are very different. Now, as humans, rules are introduced to us when we are a little one. Um, we're a little kid and our parents have to watch us because we might do the wrong thing. So your mom says, you have to stay in this room. But my brother's over there in that room. I want to go in that room. No, but I can't watch you in that room, so I need you to stay here. So we look at rules as a negative. And we also look at enforcing rules as being mean. Mom, why won't you let me go play with my brother? Well, mom's not being mean, she just needs to keep you safe. But we don't see it that, at that age. And so that's how, the, that's how rules are introduced to us. And for the rest of our lives, even when we become parents ourselves, we still look at rules as kind of a negative and enforcing the rules as kind of being mean. Now, um, what is a positive when it comes to rules in your kid? Breaking the rules. It's Friday night, I don't have school tomorrow, can I stay up late and watch this movie? And your mom's like, yeah, and you're like, yay, I get to break the rule. So that's the psychology that humans have with rules. And like I said, we carry them for the rest of our life. Now, uh, for dogs, dogs can't communicate verbally. So one of the ways that they communicate with each other and find out what they can and cannot do is by probing. I'm gonna go down and see how far I can go before somebody says, ah. Now, if the dog's not allowed in the kitchen and the second that the dog crosses the threshold, you disagree they're gonna come back and try it a little bit later on. Let's say there's an area rug here in front of us. I'm a dog and it's your area rug and it's expensive and you don't want me to go on it. And so as a dog, I'm gonna cross the threshold. The instant I cross the threshold, if you disagree with me, remember dogs learn through repetition, consistency, and good timing. Well, with three fingers, you actually have three seconds to correct or reward your dog for them to have the ability to make the connection. But it has to be repeated over and over consistently. So let's say there's the area rug in front of us and I cross the threshold here and you disagree. Like, that didn't work, so I move over and try here and you disagree. That didn't work, here, 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 here. After like 15 times, people start thinking, is this dog not gonna, when is it gonna figure it out? Well, as a dog, I'm trying to determine, does the boundary go all the way around? So I'm really being thorough, I'm not being defiant. That's how we look at it, as being defiant. So let's say 15 times in a row, I, cross the, I try to cross the threshold and you disagree, and the 16th time, you are distracted and I cross the threshold. I don't do anything wrong, but in my mind as a dog, the way that I interpret that, is, oh, in this house, I have to ask 16 times to get my way. Now, let's say the next time you block 34 times before you get distracted, and I'm like, oh, they moved the goalpost. Now I have to try 35 times. Um, and, you know, the dog's going to probe all the way around to see, is there an entry point I haven't found? And so that's when they're being, and not only just an entry point, but also a combination. Maybe when you guys are eating dinner, I can cross the threshold. Or when the kids are over there playing, the TV's on, and it's light out, maybe I can cross the threshold then. But let's say that 500 times in a row you are consistent, you're equal to the task. Every single time you try to cross that threat, I try to call the threshold, you disagree. I'm like, okay, well, you know what? They clearly don't want me to go on that rug. I'm just gonna take my list, cross that off, go on the rug. And after a week goes by, you're like, you know what, David's been such a good dog. He hasn't tried to cross this threshold once. David, why don't you come over here and cross, and, and cross the threshold and lay down on the carpet? As a dog, I'm just like, you just blew my mind. I was never gonna cross the threshold again, and now you're saying I have to cross 501 times? So it gets very confusing for dogs. Uh, and we look at breaking the rule, like I said, as a positive, but it's not. It is confusing for them. Because they go through life probing, waiting to determine, waiting for us to tell them where that rule is, it's very important that we have rules so we can act like a leader. Now we have to think, look, I'm a human, so you should respect me as the authority figure. Dogs don't see it that way. As a matter of fact, dogs are like, you only have two legs. Why should I listen to you? And dogs understand we're not part of, we're a different species. Uh, they can be a member of your family, but they understand there is a difference. Really, the way I think about it is burning energy for dogs is almost a form of currency. If the dog is doing something wrong and you're yelling at the dog not to do it, as loud and as nasty as you can, it's nowhere near as powerful if you were to silently stand up and walk over there because you're burning energy when you stand up and walk over there. So uh, we have tendency to think, look, I've adopted you. I took you to these great puppy classes at Dog No Problems. Uh, we provide you this awesome house to live in. There's dog toys, there's food, there's treats, there's a dog bed. And your dog's like, uh, no offense, but I didn't see you build this house. I didn't see you hunt that food or make that dog bed or those toys. Matter of fact, you seem kind of lazy to me. You leave the house, I'm assuming you're just having a great old time. 
Then you come back home and what do you do? You sit on your butt here and watch TV typically. Uh, you sit on your butt around the table and you should put food in your mouth or you lay in your bed and go to sleep. I don't see you acting like a leader because most people don't have any rules for the dogs. So basically um, enforcing rules consistently, even if the dog wants to do something but we say no, that can be a great way to help to establish what I like to call a healthy leader follower dynamic. Now one little offshoot to this is a lot of us accidentally train dogs to misbehave. Anything your dog is doing when you pet it is what you're, gonna, is what you're rewarding or giving the dog, uh, amplifying. So if your dog comes and sits in front of you and you don't do anything, or if your dog steals remote control and suddenly you get up and chase the dog, well, for dogs, any attention is validating. So clearly they must like me grabbing the remote control because that's the easiest way to get my human's attention. This is why we talk about petting with a purpose and passive training, which we've covered in other videos. But for rules, if we are consistent, we don't allow the dog in the furniture. The dog's gonna try over and over again, again, like I talked about earlier, through all those different capacities. And if we're equal to the task, the dog's like, you know what, I'm just not allowed in the furniture. Now that is one of the first rules I usually suggest to my clients because for dogs, the higher they sit, the more rank or social status they have. Dogs don't actually have an alpha, they kind of share leadership, but they do have kind of levels of authority. One dog might be a little bit more confident or have more authority than another. But there's not one true leader is kind of how the uh, alpha environment works and dogs don't do that. So basically, if a dog is, uh, if we are consistently enforcing rules, the dog sees us acting like a leader. They might necessarily, we, we have the negative perception, like I said, talked about earlier, that they don't, they, they think we're mean, we're not. It's a form of communication. You have to make that distinction with your puppy. Remember, you're gonna have your puppy for 10, 15, depending on the breed, you know, up to 20 years. You're gonna have a long time to let them do things. For some reason, we have puppies where like, okay, here is access to absolutely everything all at once. And we have nowhere to go up from that. When you get a job, you don't, start at the highest position, you start at a low position, and as you work hard, you get promoted, you get more privileges and access. And I want you to think of these rules as privileges and not rights. All right, so let's talk about some, uh, really quickly, because this is going to be a longer video, let's talk about some rules that we can enforce. The rules I usually suggest my clients, the first one is, like I said, not allowing them on the furniture. Now, I have Farley here on my lap because he is my senior dog, and he is kind of in hospice, and he's probably not going to be with us for very long, and it looks better when I have the dog in the furniture. However, you can see there's not a lot of dog here on this couch. Quest here is not allowed on the couch. The other dogs are not allowed on the couch. And we have another video that talked about how you can use x mats and other ways to train your dogs to get off the furniture. So um, I don't allow dogs on the furniture. For my rule for puppies, I allow them on the furniture until they can get on the furniture on their own. And then at that point, I no longer allow them on the furniture until we get to a certain threshold. The video, other video we talked about, and ask your instructor if you uh, weren't in the class to get that video, we can share that with you about how to teach your dog to get off of the furniture. So I would say uh, dogs are not allowed on the furniture until you, they are well behaved and trained and they're not chewing stuff up and barking and being mischievous. And at that point, they should be allowed on the furniture on a per case basis. So I feel like inviting Farley up, I invite him up, he gets up, that's a one time privilege. If he starts barking or whining or pushing me or whatever, he has to get down. Or let's say that he gets up on, my, uh, on the furniture and then he goes to get to drink water when he comes back, he would need another invitation. That way I am the authority figure and the dog has to see and get permission from me in order to get a privilege. Uh, another rule I have is at the door. Um, for dogs, sitting is a more subordinate position, which is why we spend so much time in talking about asking a dog to sit for passive training, for petting with a purpose and all those fun things. But it's also, if a dog sits down, it's kind of putting itself at a slight disadvantage. If somebody tried to grab me, I have to go through three movements to get up to start moving away. So that puts me at a little bit of a disadvantage. So for, uh, I like to ask a dog to sit almost, you should almost think of sitting as a way of saying please or thank you. So I go to the door, I tell the dog to sit and I tell it one time. The dog now has three seconds to sit. If the dog doesn't sit by the third second, I don't repeat the command. The, remember, the more you repeat it, the less you mean it. I walk away, I sit down somewhere, <laughs> you hang in there buddy, and I wait for one minute and ask Google or Alexa or whatever you have or set a uh, timer on your watch because it'll go by too far, too quick or too, not quick enough. After one minute, go back to the door and tell the dog, command, sit, and it has three seconds to comply. If it doesn't sit, walk away this time for two minutes, next time for four minutes, next time for eight minutes, and make sure you're sitting down somewhere nearby but not at the door. Um, and uh, eventually when you go to the door and say sit, the dog sits, boom, you open that door like there's remote control in their butt. Now, the only time that I don't do this is if it's a potty training issue. We don't want to have the dog, have it. well, you wouldn't let me out, so I had an accident. 
If you're potty training, this would come in a little bit later. Um, but basically what will happen eventually, the dog goes sit at the door as a way of saying, I'd like to go outside. I have a lot of dogs that go pound and jump up at the door because that, like I talked to Bert earlier, gets the attention from the humans. And when we humans train their dogs to go jump and pound at the door to get their attention. If your dog pounds at the door, the best thing you do is ignore it. I know it's hard, if, especially if you're worried the dog's going to break the door. But the more that you react, the more the dog's going to continue offering that behavior. If you follow this rule uh, with the sitting at the door, eventually your dog goes and sits at the door. It's a nice, polite, well-mannered dog. Now, um, I first do this whatever direction the dog wants to do. If it wants to go outside, do it when it's inside. If it wants to come inside, do it when it's outside. And also make sure your dog can sit. Some people have steps that go outside the door to the backyard, and it's a narrow step, and the dog won't sit there, doesn't feel like sitting. Then you might skip and forego that one. Another one is I eat first. Uh, another rule, I should say. Uh, for dogs, they is the most important activity for dogs. They eat in the wild. They spend 90% of their time in the wild looking for food. When they do eat, they eat in the order of the rank or the perception of hierarchy. So the leaders eat first, and then the sub-leaders eat, then the medium group, and then the followers. And so if you, a lot of people free feed their dog, which is a problem. Hopefully you bought the, uh, the treat dispensary toys that we talked about in class and fed your dogs out of that for a month or two to really get them jump-started on chewing toys instead of your furniture and your shoes. Um, so I have four dogs here. Uh, Farley here is my senior dog, and so he gets to eat first. The other three dogs have to go sit their butt in the corner and wait while there's food in their bowls and they don't have permission to eat. Now before I feed Farley, I eat something first. Now an actual meal would be better, but if you don't have an actual meal, just eating something in five or more bites will work. Um, so a chip, a cracker, preferably something crunchy that's gonna, uh, that's gonna sound like you're eating. Um, and then when I get done eating, I use passive training to assign the dogs a command word. His word is chow, Callie's word is grub, Quest's word is feast, Max's word is lasagna. Come up with a fun command word. So they eat one at a time. I give them permission to eat. And there are times where I forget to feed Quest because I'm, I'm actually out of the room. I'm not even in the room supervising anymore. And I give him a phone call and I forget about it. I go in the kitchen an hour later to get a drink of water. He's still sitting 10 feet away from his bowl waiting for permission to eat. That's wonderful self-control. And I do that. I do take care of him. I hook him up with some cheese and some other stuff. Uh, but I don't do it on purpose. But it's wonderful to get there. Now, it took me a long time to get there, so don't have that expectation right away. Uh, but by eating something in, for, in front of your dog, it kind of helps them see, okay, he has more rank or status. If they don't, they're like, why should I listen to you? You don't even have status in the most important activity for dogs. All it takes is a minute or two to or, you know, uh, do this consistently for a week or two, and your dogs will be all on top of it. So you eat something first, and then after you get done eating, you give your puppy permission to eat. Now, if your puppy goes in and sniffs the food and doesn't eat it, I pick up the bowl, I dump it, and I put the empty bowl back down. The dog does not eat again until the next meal. I don't over-encourage the dog to do it. Now, some dogs will be hesitant, so the first couple times you can encourage a little bit, but don't put any doctored food in there. Eventually, hunger becomes your ally. My parents had a miniature schnauzer. Uh, I feed three times a day. She gets egg yolks and dumplings, or she did when my, she was alive with my parents, and that's all she would eat. She got so fat, she was a square. So she came to stay with me for five days, and she ate in the fifth position after all four of my dogs. And for, four, for three days, and I feed three times a day, she would, there's no egg yolk in here, I'm not eating this swivel. And then she would walk away. As soon as she walked away, I picked up the bowl, I dumped it empty, and I put the empty bowl back on the ground. Putting the empty bowl on the ground is important. If your puppy gets up and carries the bowl around, get a porcelain bowl, something heavy they can't do, or an elevated bowl. So they missed the opportunity to eat. Just like if your kids say, I don't want to eat meatloaf, I want pizza. Well, you can eat the meatloaf or you can go to bed. Now, this is usually the case for older dogs. If you get a puppy established with good eating habits right away, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Uh, so uh, when I'm eating, I don't allow the dogs within seven feet of me because that is a way a dog would challenge for something is by invading personal space. And it's highly inappropriate for a puppy to be within seven feet or any dog with, uh, uh, to anyone or anything that has a high value item. Don't feed your dog people food because that confuses the heck out of them and you're going to train your puppies to invade your personal space. They're going to do that with your guests and your kids and everybody else. We don't eat the best food. It's better for your dogs not to eat people food. And some people food actually is toxic to dogs like onion and garlic, which is in just about every meat we have. And remember, no ribs for dogs. Cooked bones can splinter and shred the dog's interior. It's an old school. I used to do it myself before I realized that. They can have uh, non-cooked bones, but not cooked bones. Um, so don't feed your, peop your dog people food. Make sure they are seven feet away from the uh, table when you're eating or the couch or wherever it is. A lot of people have area rugs in their house. If you have an area rug kind of right in front of your table and you're sitting in front, uh, on a couch like this and the TV's behind the camera, well, then I might say the dog's not allowed on the carpet while I'm eating. That's a nice, easy line to determine. When there's no food, the dog can come and go as they please, but not when I'm eating. 
I also do the same thing in the kitchen. When I'm cooking food, I don't let a dog in the kitchen. We have a video actually about how to establish an invisible boundary and teach your dog to get out of the kitchen. I invite you to uh, watch that one as well. Uh, let me see. Also for dogs, whoever's in front is perceived to be the leader. So if I'm going through a door with my dog, my dog always comes out behind me. Uh, if you let your dog go through first, then they're going to get confused and thinking that they are literally in the leadership position. So uh, these are some examples of rules. There's a whole lot of other things you can do for, uh, for dogs, making them sit uh, and wait before you uh, give them their food. Or, you know, if I'm going to play fetch, you have to sit and drop the ball and then sit before I pick it up. Things along those lines. So look for ways to incorporate some rules and consistently enforce them so your dog sees you acting like a leader. The more that you enforce your dog's rules consistently, the more the dog will respect your authority. And then when you do give a command, they don't look at it as optional. But if you don't have any rules, I promise you, your dog will think that listening to you is optional. It's much better to start a puppy off with rules and structure, just like we do kids, to help them establish good behavior patterns. Like I said, if you don't allow them the furniture for a month or six months or whatever it is, eventually you can allow them later on once they're well behaved, just like your kids have to go to uh, bed at a certain time and all the rest of that fun stuff. But when they get to become adults, they set their own time schedule. But you set them up for success by helping them start off on the right foot. And that's a good, that's basically how you should think about enforcing your rules. So this is, a, uh, this is uh, basically a summary of how you, rules and enforcing rules consistently can help your dog see you as an authority figure.